station, we're having an exercise, SF exercise. We're having a calm out. Okay. Guys. Happy, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Between September 2000 and June 2001, the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, would scramble fighter jets to intercept errant aircraft 67 times. Interceptions are routine and usually occur within 10 minutes of a sign of trouble, such as permanently losing radio contact and transponder signal or flying off course. On the morning of September 11th, according to official accounts, Four commercial airliners would be off course and out of communication, and not one of them would be intercepted. How is it that on four separate occasions, on one day, that a trillion dollar military and intelligence infrastructure could fail? I don't think anybody could have predicted that these people would take an airplane and slam it into the World Trade Center, take another one and slam it into the Pentagon. Nobody in our government, at least, and I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes into buildings on such a massive scale. But that turns out not to be true. U.S. military planners did envision and practice those very scenarios. As reported by USA Today, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, NORAD, conducted exercises with fighter jets, simulating hijacked planes flown into the World Trade Center in the two years before the attacks. Pentagon planners also envisioned the attack on the Pentagon five months before it happened. According to this April 2001 Pentagon email, Air Force officials wanted a war game, having a terrorist group hijack a commercial airline and fly it into the Pentagon. The idea was to check response times to launch fighter jets. But according to the Pentagon email, the plan was ultimately rejected by senior Pentagon officials as too unrealistic. Still to come are questions, big questions, about NORAD's response on the day of the attack. Why, despite all the exercises and the planning, Peter, jet fighters were not in place anywhere near New York or Washington. It's quite an amazing story. Many thanks, Brian. Brian Ross. One drill called Amalgam Virgo was conducted on June 1st and 2nd, 2001, and simulated successful terrorist attacks. Its purpose was to focus on unconventional threats, including an airborne hijacking. One plan would simulate the hijacking of a commercial airliner, which would be crashed into the capital. The second part of the exercise, which was planned but not executed before 9-11, involved two planes with actual pilots on the flight deck. FBI agents would hijack the planes and divert them to secure locations. And on its cover? Osama bin Laden. In fact, multiple war games were underway on 9-11 itself. The question was, we had four war games going on on September 11th, and the question that I tried to pose before the uh, secretary had to go to lunch was um, whether or not the activities of the four war games going on on September 11th actually impaired our ability to, to respond to the attacks? The answer to the question is no, did not impair our response. In fact, uh, General Eberhardt, who was in the commander of North American Aerospace Defense Command, as he testified in front of the 9-11 Commission, I believe, I believe he told them that it enhanced our ability to respond. There were two CPXs. There was one Department of Justice exercise that didn't have anything to do with the, the other three, and there was an actual operation ongoing because there was some Russian bomber activity up near Alaska. So, did the war games ultimately help or hinder our response? September 11th was day two of Vigilant Guardian, an exercise staged by the Joint Chiefs and NORAD, which simulated hijacked planes in the northeastern United States. Vigilant Guardian is a branch of Global Guardian, a mass Armageddon exercise being conducted at Offutt Air Force Base in cooperation with NORAD. Originally scheduled to take place in late October, Global Guardian was moved to September. 
The exercise is reportedly cancelled after the second Twin Tower is hit. Three E-4B Doomsday planes remain airborne. Two government sources familiar with the incident tell CNN it was a military aircraft. They say the details are classified. This comparison of the CNN video and an official Air Force photo suggests the mystery plane is among the military's most sensitive aircraft, an Air Force E-4B. The E-4B is a state-of-the-art flying command post, built and equipped for one reason, to keep the government running no matter what, even in the event of a nuclear war. Ask the Pentagon, and it insists this is not a military aircraft, and there is no mention of it in the official report of the 9-11 Commission. The Pentagon, the Secret Service, and the FAA all say they, at least for public consumption, have no explanation of the giant plane over the president's house, just as the smoke began to rise across the river at the Pentagon. Barksdale Air Force Base also participated in Global Guardian. Instead of returning directly to Washington, D.C., President Bush would fly to both Barksdale and off at Air Force Base before returning to the White House. Another drill, Northern Vigilance, moved fighter jets to Canada and Alaska to monitor a fleet of Russian MiGs on a training mission. Northern Vigilance also placed inputs onto military radar screens. Also referred to as phantoms, inputs are simulated errant aircraft which appear real to those participating in the exercise. We fought many phantoms that day. Three F-16s from Andrews Air Force Base, located 15 miles from the Pentagon, are flown 180 nautical miles away for a training mission in North Carolina. Fort Belvoir, an army base 10 miles south of the Pentagon, intended to test security in case of a terrorist attack. Employees in the Office of Emergency Management on the 23rd floor of World Trade Center Building 7 continue preparations for Tripod, a biological attack drill scheduled for September 12th. Finally, the National Reconnaissance Office in Virginia begins a drill at 845 conducted by a team from the CIA in which a plane crashes into their building. Also, a number of war games were being conducted that have yet to be fully disclosed. Commissioner Gorelick. Um, could, could you please be quiet? We have only a few minutes with General Myers. I'd like to ask a question. General Myers, the... I'm, I'm sorry. I, I would ask, please, people in the audience to be quiet if you want to stay here. Submitted some. Sir, sir, I... Statement. This commission has not answered uh, my questions. I'm walking out. It's uh, a farce. I will. Thank you. So let me get this straight. On the morning of 9-11, the United States is running drills in which hijacked aircraft go in and out of radar. Fighter jets are flown out of the United States and planes are crashed into buildings. What a coincidence. And in terms of what motivated me to bring all the aircraft down, as you see one thing happen, that's an accident. When you see two of the same thing occur, it's a pattern. But when you see three of the same thing occur, it's a program. And so at that point, I decided to bring all the aircraft down. And so, at 9.45, all airborne planes were forced to land. This order applied to all civilian aircraft. Certain military planes were allowed to remain airborne. By 12.16 that afternoon, the FAA managed to ground over 4,000 planes without incident. Uh, during the time that the airplane coming in to the Pentagon uh, there was a young man who would come in and say to the vice president, the, the plane is 50 miles out, the plane is 30 miles out. And when it got down to the plane is 10 miles out, uh, the young man also said to the vice president, do the orders still stand? And uh, the vice president turned and whipped his neck around and said, of course the orders still stand. Have you heard anything to the contrary?
937, Arlington, Virginia. American Airlines Flight 77 allegedly crashes into the ground floor of the Pentagon. Pentagon authorities will deny that the building had anti-aircraft defense. The FBI arrives within minutes, and the site is declared a federal crime scene, becoming their exclusive responsibility. With the help of civilians, they comb the Pentagon lawn for debris, and within 24 hours, they had confiscated every known video of the attack. Pentagon officials initially denied that any of their cameras captured the event. However, on March 7, 2002, five images taken by a security camera from across the heliport are released. For years, these five frames were the only public footage of the Pentagon attack. This would change on October 14, 2004, when Scott Bingham would file a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit requesting videotapes that captured the impact of Flight 77. Special Agent Jacqueline McGuire of the FBI located a CD-ROM that contains copies of two time-lapse recordings made by security cameras, released on March 16, 2006. A video taken from a Sitgo gas station, which is open only to Pentagon employees, released on September 15, 2006. And the Doubletree Hotel in Arlington, Virginia, released on December 7, 2006. Agent McGuire concluded that the FBI possessed 85 videotapes that might be potentially responsive. As of this date, we have no clear images of what happened at the Pentagon on the morning of 9-11. The official story goes as such. American Airlines Flight 77 was taken over by five hijackers, led by Hani Hanjour. Hanjour entered the United States in 1996 to become a professional airline pilot. He would not complete a single course. It was kind of a waste of time. He wouldn't show up for uh, flights on time, didn't do his homework. Average or below average piloting skills. English was very poor, uneventful from our perspective. Yeah. The 9 11 Commission concludes that Han Yor was perhaps the most experienced and highly trained pilot. Flight 93's hijacker, Saeed Al Gandhi was a former Saudi fighter pilot. How could Hanyor be more experienced than him? On the morning of 9-11, Hani Hanyor and his four accomplices traveled to Dulles International Airport outside of Washington, D.C. They had spent the weeks beforehand at the Valencia Motel in Laurel, Maryland, six miles from the National Security Agency. All five will set off metal detectors and be subjected to additional screening, yet all of them proceed to board American Airlines Flight 77, which is described by the Washington Post as unusually light on passengers. Out of 188 seats, 64 would be filled. In fact, all four planes involved in 9-11 would be at approximately 30% capacity. The hijackers will board alongside Barbara Olson, the wife of Solicitor General Ted Olson, and a number of employees from Boeing, Raytheon, the Department of Defense, Lockheed Martin, American Airlines, the Navy, Army, and other government agencies. The pilots were Officer David Charlebois and Captain Charles Burlingame. Charles Frank Burlingame III, an aeronautical engineer and a graduate of both the Naval Academy and Top Gun Fighter Pilot School, flew F-4 fighter jets and developed anti-terrorism strategies at the Pentagon before retiring in 1989 to take a job at American Airlines. 
He would remain active in the reserves and anti-terrorism exercises until 1996. His Boeing 757 would